All right, thank you and um, welcome to the December 13th, 2021 study session. Uh, we're gonna be talking about infill housing incentives today mm -hmm. and I will turn it over to um, staff, Ms. Driscoll. I trust you're gonna be walking us through this PowerPoint. I am, thank you, Madam Mayor, commissioners. Uh, just as a reminder, this came up earlier this fall when we were talking about IRBs and RHIDs, which are policies we currently have adopted that are more greenfield focused. And the request of the commission was to discuss what what were our plans in moving forward for infill housing, which is kind of the opposite of the greenfield component. Uh, Scott's going to be helping me kind of click through this. So Scott, if you could go forward to the slide, it's slide four these three circles is where we're at. Thank you, Scott. I wanted to start the presentation off by just reminding ourselves what came out of the supplemental update that we adopted this summer. Um, we adopted both a 2021 supplemental update to the Live Salina plan, which is the city's housing plan in uh, July, that was July 19th of this year. And then we also adopted an economic housing incentives policy. Those were both adopted um, at the same time via resolution 217971. But Marty kind of wrapped up, uh, wrapped up that supplemental update by focusing on a multi-year approach to how would we start to meet our goals and objectives for housing. Um, with kind of the gentle reminder, and if you look at these circles, what you'll see is zero to three, which is what we're smack dab in the middle of, is address the at immediate housing demand. You know, we have a bulk of units that are needed. How do you address that quickly um, and build the capacity to um, address our core needs and then demonstrate demand as well? And that's kind of focused on some of the issues we've had in the past is we haven't built a lot of market rate multifamily, whether it's infill or greenfield in years. How do we demonstrate that so it starts to come more readily to the community? And that's where really in that medium three to eight years, we start looking at increasing our transition into expanding ownership and then neighborhood fortification, which is a way of saying greenfield, or I'm sorry, infill development. That's strategies for really getting into some of our, our neighborhoods where we have one or two lots available um, and we have development surrounding that. And then lastly, we move into that long term of eight plus years where we're really taking what we've learned prior to that, and we're building upon it and creating that maintenance and sustainability of our housing market. Next slide, please. I popped this one up there because this is really some of the things that we're working through right now. And I guess there is a rhyme and reason to this. We can't do it all at once. It's really easy to look at all these tools and go, well, that one works and that one, and I want that one, and I want that one. And I'm probably the most guilty of that. But if there's anything we've kind of seen in the last few months is it takes time and resources to do all of this. And so where do we find that? Where do we prioritize that? And Marty kind of led us down that path already that are we doing the things that deal with this immediate need? And then how do we start to prepare for these other things that need to happen in the long run? I'd also add in kind of talking with some of our um, contractors who do some of our infill housing work, uh, they've, they've reminded me uh, with a little bit of a smile that if it were so easy, everybody would be doing it. So there are definite challenges to infill housing that are, are unknown to us and they take longer to address. So let's uh, go next slide to neighborhood fortification because this is really the concepts that is or are infill housing and that's building needed projects with demonstrated demand on infill sites to build value and credibility of established neighborhoods. Um, Pre-COVID, we did adopt a land bank and uh, with the help of Amanda, who is our housing fellow with Lead for Kansas, we are gonna be bringing the policy that goes along with said land bank to you in January. Um, and that will complement what legally exists is in taking properties that are given to the bank and holding on to those, but also give some framework into what properties you want to move into the bank. Not all land is created equal. And um, one of the things that we've learned from many communities before is the land that you take in the bank needs to have purpose. Otherwise you end up getting a lot of things you might not want or know how to deal with or want to maintain. But when we talk about compiling land and helping to demonstrate 
an established neighborhood, sometimes part of that is being able to hold on to a couple properties in an area, often through a land bank, until there's a redevelopment opportunity. And so again, that's something that takes some time to pull together. Um, using housing partnerships as a main force of advancing this concept in collaboration with the city. I think what Marty's trying to say is it's not all the city that has to be responsible for this. There are other entities out there that may want to partner with us, whether it's the state, whether it's a private developer doing a public-private partnership, maybe it's a, a nonprofit developer who is able to do some of those things. Um, and sometimes, not necessarily a nonprofit developer, but a nonprofit. Maybe they have a social component in it. They are able to act as a monetary partner, and somebody else is acting as like the developing partner. But there, there, there are partnerships to be had, and it can't all be the city. Make city capital investments that support fortification of our efforts. This can't be done without funding. Whether it's funding through uh, rehab programs that we're going to talk about, whether it's funding through improving older infrastructure or connecting older pieces of infrastructure, that's kind of the difference in infill versus greenfield. In infill, most of the time, the infrastructure's there. Um, what we do find sometimes is it's just connecting a block or two, but it's not installing a whole new set of infrastructure like we see in Greenfield. Um, but we still need to make sure that we're understanding that there's capital investments to make, improving sidewalks, roads, those types of things. Create conditions that are feasible for private reinvestment um, from individual home ownership to substantial uh, developers. If it were easy, everybody would be doing it. It is the conditions in which you have to do these flips, whether it's the appraised value of the neighboring homes not equaling what you had to put into the home to flip it, um, whether it is trying to accumulate enough properties to make a project viable. There are a variety of things in there that make those conditions difficult. What can we do to help improve those conditions? And then revisit the neighborhood revitalization plan for its effectiveness and make necessary program modifications. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Other examples of, next slide please, neighborhood fortification, just to kind of give you some ideas. And not all of these have to be programs or policies. And some of these things kind of happen based on the results of the programs and policies we're gonna talk about here in a few slides. But, you know, neighborhood fortification can be affordable senior housing. You know, not everything has to be market rate in order to stabilize a neighborhood. We can have some of those other types of products in there. Um, equity builders, those are some programs um, where you are looking at like owner, or you, you rent to own basically type situations. Uh, a lot of times in neighborhood fortification, one of the things we talk about is if everything turns to rental, is there a different um, level of investment by residents? I have argued for a long time that renters aren't bad people. They, in fact, great, make great neighbors. But there is a different level of investment. There's also a different level of investment that comes from landlords versus a property owner. It's often not the renters. So what we're looking for, just like we've been talking about in our other things, is balance. That's really what makes strong neighborhoods is variety of product, variety of price point, and variety of ownership types whether that's a landlord rental scenario or an owner-occupied scenario. Little infill mini subdivisions, um, sometimes we call them clustering. This really goes hand in hand with the land bank and trying to accumulate enough properties where you can do those things. But it's just trying to kind of, you know, there's a couple different ways to say this, but you're just trying to kind of give people an idea a subdivision does not need to be multi-acre. That with a smaller product type, you can take, you know, just, a couple lots and turn them into something. I was talking to a fellow planner who's working up in the Boise area, and they were saying, you know, what used to be hot was five and 10 acre parcels. Now it's if you've got anything two or less, they're trying to kind of scoop in and do these little mini developments. It's a lot more, it's, it's a lot faster to do. People can pick up the product faster. It doesn't take as long to build. So there are those individuals who are looking for those types of products. It's just, are, do we have the right reinvestment community environment for them to do that, and do they know they can do that here? Um, combination of housing and support services. We also need to make sure that in neighborhood fortification, we're not, 
you know, creating food deserts, you know, that we, we aren't lacking things like childcare and laundromats and those other types of neighborhood commercial uses that make a neighborhood desirable. Do they have a right amount of bus stops, walkable uh, trails and sidewalks, those types of things. And new housing forms need to be used. And that's what I was saying, that diversification of product. You know, not everybody wants to live in a single family home, but not everybody wants to live in an apartment. There are other things in between that. We need to offer those different types of things, even in our existing neighborhoods. Adaptive reuse and historic preservation. I love a big, beautiful old house as much as anybody, but trying to find families that need nine bedrooms <laughs> and want to and are able to afford and keep those up can be very difficult. You know, we've seen it in a lot of communities and it can be done well as where some of those older, bigger homes are turned into apartments. You know, not 19 apartments, but, you know, townhomes or um, for a fourplex or something like that. They can be done tastefully. They can be rentals. They can also be turned into condos. So there's some things to look at in our neighborhoods too where we have some of those homes and that's that adaptive reuse. From a city support perspective, um, looking at building envelope rehab, neighborhood street rehabilitation. We talked a little bit about these sidewalk upgrades, streetscape, lighting, uh, park enhancements, and then that NRP revitalization. You know, that capital reinvestment in those neighborhoods, it's amazing when neighborhoods feel like they're being invested in, owners start to reinvest. I mean, we see it a lot of times on a smaller scale when this person paints their home, magically the next person paints their home. And guess what? This person put a new mailbox in. There's, there's an intrinsic value that starts to kind of play off of each other when those things happen. And that same thing happens when we do new sidewalks, when we improve the streetscape. We see those improvements. I wanted to take this slide to just talk to you a little bit about the state's housing plan. This is the first uh, housing plan for the state of Kansas in 30 years. Big deal. Um, I will say that I think the state did a good job of public participation. They worked hard to reach out to everybody. I think a lot of voices were heard, especially in difficult times. I mean, you kind of have this, we're still in kind of a COVID moment, but they were able to create Zoom meetings. They went out into the community. They held meetings pre and post. No plan is perfect, but I feel like this is pretty reflective of us. And I saw good participation in our region and the other associated regions. The plan will come out in January, but they had their uh, kind of dog and pony show last week that uh, several of us sat through, and I think a couple of commissioners were there as well. Um, but I wanted to just give you a few of these notes, just because I think it's interesting that we're not alone. <laughs> you know, some of the things that we learned from Marty and some of the things that we're experiencing were definitely um, highlighted in the plan. So, and just so you know, RDG, actually did the state's plan, who's did our housing plan as well. So uh, most of the state's housing stock is 60 plus years old. That's, that's pretty substantial. So that means that anytime you're, you've got a home, you're more than likely your new homeowner is gonna be looking at putting work into it, you know, updating that and, and doing work to that. A further investment is required beyond what they've paid for the home. Managing the conditions of our existing housing stock needs to be a priority. We just talked about that. You know, we have houses that are aging. Are they being reinvested in? Are they getting the maintenance, the care, those updates that keep them as viable structures? Um, relative to income, housing values are depressed in many rural communities. We've talked about this, that we know certain people could buy more, could rent more, but what's available is not really what they're willing to spend more on. And we haven't been producing new stock that is then making the existing stock start to improve itself. It's that whole continual market component. So when we have depressed values in housing, it makes it difficult to go out and get conventional financing because your neighboring properties are not going to appraise for what you're trying to build. Renters in this current market are the most burdened by cost of housing. You know, we've talked about HUD and that 30% component, 30% of your income, no more than that should be going to housing. And so anything over that is house burdened. And of those burdened, renters are being hit the most. Housing costs for renters have gone up since 2010, but the conditions are not improving. So that means the, the quality of rental accommodation that they are renting 
does not necessarily meet what they're paying, but that's what's available. Many different incomes are competing for units at that same price. So again, because you're not putting new product into the market and you've got this restricted amount of units, you have people who could afford up here paying for this and people who should be paying down here paying here because it's all there is. So it creates a really difficult situation for, for all buyers and it really starts to mess with the overall market. Past and present production of housing is preventing households from moving to the market, options that match their incomes and stages of life. Really jives with that last statement. They did do surveys. <coughs> they had 44,000 participants, and then they broke those out and pulled out developers, builders, things like that, and just took, um, for this next question, it was just feedback from everybody who's not in the trades or not in development. So it would be you know, citizens, economic development boards, chambers, of commerce, that kind of stuff. The question is, what is the most needed housing assistance? And they presented the results for both for North Central Region and South Central Region, since we're kind of right there on the border of both. And where we're influenced by comes from both North and South. North Central Region said housing rehab loans and grants would make the biggest difference in housing. And then South Central Region said down payment assistance would make the biggest difference with a close second of rehab. So very similar to some of the things that we've been talking about. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna go through these really quickly. Well, I'm just gonna basically touch on them. We do have current incentives. We talked about this earlier in the year when we were dealing with the plan and, and the upcoming policy. Most commonly for housing, we talk about the CID process, and that is, has a geographical pre uh, preference to it, so it's only within certain areas. Then we also have the NRP, so that's Neighborhood Revitalization Plan, and that's also geographically constricted to a certain mapped area. And then we have the SRA. So because we've gone over these, and I wanna use our time to talk about these new tools, I've also included the maps, if you could just click through those, Scott. Just to kind of give you an area, CID takes in quite a bit of the community. NRP is there in the blue and the green. And then SRA is just that large blue area. So I will say on top of these, you could probably consider the um, opportunity zones as economic development tools. The only reason I hesitate to add them is one, they're, they're not ours. It's a, it's a federal component to this. It's basically if you are to use capital gains tasks and reinvest them in a certain area, you get other tax benefits on those capital gains. Um, that program from the time it was adopted has been kind of all over the place. It still gets used. We have two districts in Salina. We cannot have any more. We actually have sought legal counsel on that to see if we could have more of them. We can't. And the life cycle of that program, I'm not sure how long it's going to endure. So for as long as it is, it's a benefit and it really doesn't hurt us to have one, but we can't move them around. They're primarily over the airport area and kind of part of downtown and, and into North Salina. So pros to our existing and current tools is there's a variety of them. It's not like we're just one little thing, um, and focused on critical neighborhoods. Uh, it's very, you know, as you saw, each map is focusing on a certain area, so certain neighborhoods are getting highlighted. We do have, as part of your policy adoption with the economic incentives for housing, IRBs and RHIDs on the books, but those aren't typically used for infill, so that's one of the other reasons I'm not really getting into those, because that's much more about Greenfield. But what are the cons to these current infill tools that we have? The financial rewards are generally after the project is completed. So no assistance getting the project started. For a lot of people, it's that capital. Like, how do I, how do I get this thing off the ground? Um, process can take more time or resources than the average homeowner has, is willing to do. So, I mean, part of that is looking at, are we making the process possible for somebody to do while still meeting all the expectations of transparency and documentation, those types of things. 
And then most tools are not aimed at home, homeowners, but rather developer builder. So if we look at who's in these neighborhoods we're trying to fortify, we may need to be engaging with a different audience. The tools are, are aimed at the wrong, wrong folks. Okay, so this gets into what is it we'd like to use? How do we build our toolbox on infill housing? So the first one is neighborhood revitalization program because we have it on the books. Um, I put this one first because we distinctly talked about this while developing the um, update to the housing plan and talking about what could go in our housing policy. This is not a bad program. In fact, it's a great program, but I can tell you it's one of the ones that's hard to administer and the average homeowner is quite frustrated when they have to come in every year, fill out the paperwork and kind of go through all of this. I think we could make it easier. Um, I've talked with staff about this. I think the whole coming in, filling out new paperwork, we could do a lot of essentially information verifying ourselves and it would probably be easier and faster than having them come in and redo this. One of the things about neighborhood revitalization program is it's a rebate. So you have to go and pay your taxes and then they get rebated to you. So again, the investment you're making is in for the long haul and you have to be willing to put that money up front and then get it over time. The nice thing about this too is the application must be filed within 60 days of the building permit issuance. So if you didn't realize it until you came in, because a lot of times we, when we're looking at building permits and you're in one of the areas, we'll let you know give you the application and give you a heads up about the process. So it does allow for that. If you weren't aware, you haven't totally missed that opportunity. So pros is accessible for individual homeowners, yes. And it does mitigate the tax burden for 10 years. I think that's one of the things that I've heard from some of the builders who have said, look, the people who need to do these rental projects, if you put $20,000, $10,000 even into these houses, it's gonna change their taxes and will they be able to afford the taxes on that home, um, particularly for folks that are maybe older and living on fixed incomes. They may need to do those things in order to sell that property someday, but where are they going to live? They can't even sell it to go somewhere else because that's where this whole system comes in where we need additional units. But what we're also going to see is as we start to build some of that multifamily where somebody may move out of something, the next person coming in is going to have to make some investments because people haven't been making those for a variety of reasons. I think it's been noted, particularly uh, Commissioner Hoppick noted that the map doesn't cover areas it really should. And it has been a significant amount of time since we comprehensively looked at that map and asked ourselves, is it covering the areas of the community that we really want the program to apply to? That's probably changed. Um, still requires participants to, to pay their taxes. It's not a full abatement, it's a rebate. Participants need to come up with the money up front. And like I said, administration's intense. I think this is probably one of our easiest kind of low-lying fruits that we, we could address is working to, to update this program, to look at the map again and to revise the administration of it so it's easier to apply. And of course, I think we could do some better outreach to homeowners um, so that they understand the program and, and how it applies. Next slide, please. Real quick question. Yeah. Just want to make sure if if someone uses this to renovate a home, the, the neighborhood revitalization program, and then sells that home, that transfers to the new owners, correct? I actually don't know the answer to that. I believe so. I, I think I, that's why I'm asking. I, I mean, I can see where it'd be beneficial that it, it, it pass on to the new owners if, if that property is sold and not used as an investment property. So, I will look into that further, but that's also something I think would be important to have in the marketing material. So if you're somebody who's able to put that investment in but maybe don't want to stay with the longevity of home, the new owner could reap that investment. Okay, next slide, please. Nope, one more back, sorry. Energy efficiency and weatherization assistance. This is one of the topics that the state identified in the state housing plan that they thought th this is an area where we could see improvement. And we won't really know what the implementation of the state's plan is gonna look like probably till after this legislative session. 
there's a lot of money that's we're going to call it identified. I don't know if it's truly been allocated uh, to housing, but it's been identified for housing and could go to programs like this. Unfortunately, Kansas, unlike some states where the utilities like gas or electric have really good upgrade programs, we're not there. There are a couple programs, um, one through KHRC, which is Kansas Housing Resource Corporation, that for certain low-income families, they can get help with insulation, lighting, windows, doors, pretty much everything you need to really shore up a house and get that, um, get that weather tight. It's a good program. It takes marketing and it takes a lot of um, handholding. I think one of the things we've learned through working through some of these programs, particularly with folks that are low income or elderly or disabled, the more paperwork we have, the harder it is to get through the, they, they need a lot of staff interaction to get through those processes. So just knowing that those programs take human resources to really be able to get people to utilize them just because they're out there isn't really enough. They need almost like a case manager who's going to sit there, fill out the application with them. You know, let's say we need documentation of your statement of your income or whatever. Well, where do I get that? Well, you're going to need to call your bank. Well, I called the bank and they haven't called me. Well, you need to call them back again. It's just those kinds of things to get through those types of programs. And that one is specifically for low-income families. Um, energy Efficiency State Loan Program. So this one allows you to install and use of alternative energy generation and different technologies up to 30000 uh, to be paid back over 15 years at 4%. So again, you, you have to fit this particular area of what needs to be improved, and you're able to get this certain amount, but you're going to need to pay it back and with interest. So for certain situations, that might be ideal, um, but it's really not enough. And why weatherization really gets into an affordability infill type of situation is that's often what makes our older homes unaffordable. I deal with this when we're talking to folks in our human relations division and looking at applications coming in. I've got folks that are paying, you know, seven, eight, nine hundred bucks a month in rent and eight hundred dollars a month in utilities. In the summer, the air conditioning is just literally leaving the building. I've in the winter when the heat's on, it's literally leaving the building. Windows are old, roofs need to be repaired. And I'm I'm not trying to kind of point anybody's finger, but it's a real cost issue. And, and it's not always a rental issue. It's just somebody's not been able to make those investments into the home. And so weatherization is one way that you can kind of, you can sure up the home, make those critical home improvements and reduce their, their cost of home ownership. And ideally they're able to put that money that they're saving back into the community, back into commerce, but also as they go to change their position on the housing ladder, that house is a more stable, viable piece of our housing stock. So can the, can these programs be used both by owner-occupied and investment? Certain ones. I believe the energy efficiency state loan program can be, but the weatherization is for owner only. It's for owner only. Through KHRC. Because that's specifically for low-income families. So, and what's, what's challenging about these is they're very low qualification or very narrow qualification pools, and they're not easy to apply for or to administer. We kind of talked a little bit about that. So North Central Regional Planning Commission does help to administer this program for KHRC, and I think we could work with them to, I think, market the program a bit better and make sure folks are aware of it, um, but it's not a solution for everybody. And then the question is, do we look at developing our own program or do we wait to kind of see what comes out of the legislature this, uh, this spring, knowing that it's an identified issue in their new plan? It also could be something that we couple with like a home rehab program that, you know, if we did some kind of matrix of points or something that, you know, doing higher quality windows or uh, uh, higher grade insulation, replacing critical HVAC components or new roofs would, would be higher on the list of important things that the rehab program is willing to fund. Um, we've seen a program in Topeka that had a very distinct rehab program where it wasn't all things under the sun, you know, just come to, you know, 
it wasn't like just bring us a house and anything that needs to be rehabbed up to this amount applies. Theirs was roofs, windows, and HVAC. And if you think about it, those are three really, really critical pieces, right? They're not only going to keep the structural integrity of the home because we don't get rot from water damage and those types of things are vermin. We lower home ownership costs and we stabilize that structure. So in a rehab world, it's kind of a win-win and it's a little bit easier to administer because it's pretty specific. Did you or did you not do or do you are not going to do these three things that we cover? Next slide. A lending consortium. This is, I think, an example of kind of what Marty was talking about, that it's, it's partnerships. In this case, um, we've seen where communities work with local lenders to create basically a, a pool of funds that can be used for rehab programs. Um, whether we're getting very specific just to HVAC, roofs, and windows, or we're saying homes of a certain price point you know, we're willing to do the gap financing on those. We've talked about where I go and put money into this house that I bought for 20000 and it took me, you know, I had to go up to 90000 just to get this thing habitable. We've done this with the Chodo. Like, you know, we, you didn't replace every window. You just replaced the most important ones. You replaced the HVAC and part of the roof, and you just, you really value engineer that to not try and go way over the market, but, man, you are right there and your surrounding properties are 20,000 less than you. That gap of what it costs you to do versus what is around you is also one of those things that a consortium can deal with is helping to do that gap financing. You can, consortiums can grant money. They can do low interest loans. There's a variety of different ways to do this and the banks do have their community reinvestment, neighborhood reinvestment act dollars that they need to put back into the community and these types of activities qualify for that. So there's um, another reason that those types of lending consortiums can work very well. So it can help a demographic of housing that is currently under, under helped, <laughs> it's not proper English, but you know that owner occupied group of housing where it's, it's not a total loss, but it's not an easy win. It's, it's the hard things, you know, you try to flip it and you're just, you're 20,000 over. There's no way you could have not been 20,000 over, but the bank doesn't want to lend on that. And that's good housing stock. That is a good house. And it, it can be brought in the market for affordable. You know, that's, that's our hottest selling stuff is that 100 to 150,000 range. And so here you've got a $90,000 house, a $100,000 house fortifying that neighborhood, but if we can't get the money to work out, we're gonna lose those houses. So that's where this type of lending really kicks in. But it takes resources to run these consortiums. It takes, somebody's gotta create an application, somebody's gotta monitor these applications, somebody's gotta vet them, There's somebody's gotta manage the board, the consortium board that's gonna make the decision, somebody has to monitor this stuff after it's done. It's it's a full new program. There's a program administrator that's assigned to that who's, who's running that. And if I don't, I can't even judge right now what the capacity is of that one person if that's solely what they did. If this goes really well, you would get to a point that you would probably need more than one person. Trying to just, at this point, I can't tell you what the average case time would be and how much time one person would be taken up in. But we would need, as far as implementation, if we were to do this, is you've got to develop the program, understand the specific issues, and what it is we're really trying to address through this consortium. There's a myriad of things. Um, we need to find those financial partners. We need to find the staff and resources to manage said program. And looking at how this program can be paired with some of those other things, it can also be paired with a land bank. It's one way too that if properties are in the bank, somebody comes in, they're interested in redeveloping that property, that gap financing could be dealt with by the consortium. Next slide. Good old fashioned rehab program. We have had these over the years. We've had under community development block grants, we had a low interest uh, loan program for home improvements. We have had a small home rehab program 
for low income individuals with projects of necessity, usually safety type things. Um, we've worked with the elderly on, you know, often our code compliance guys come across something and it's, it's just, it's just not safe. It's just not healthy for somebody. And if they're able to qualify, we're able to go through some of those, but um, it's, it's not enough to fix the level of problem that we have with our homes. This also has kind of a scale, you know, are we just doing roof rehab loans or programs? Are we just going to grant it? This isn't per se a whole consortium. This is, these are smaller amounts of money. These are something that we're either choosing to fund ourselves or we're finding another funding source. Um, this is often the kind of thing used for front porches. You know, North Salina has done a good job of, you know, identifying front porches and with these small programs, you can really start to see turnover. But this is again, an example of something we need to develop, understand the specifics, we need to find funding. No, the other one, the consortium, we need to go find the funding partners, but it's not necessarily us finding that funding. In this case, who is funding? Is that who us or, or another source? And then how do we manage in that program? Next slide. So the land bank, we've talked a little bit about this. What is it exactly? Well, it's really is, it's whatever you guys need it to be. Um, they've kind of been known over time for taking dilapidated structures. Um, it's not meant to be used as an alternative. If you're a dangerous structure, you're having compliance issues, you know, here, we suggest you go in there. Like that's utterly wrong. But we do have properties where, you know, great aunt Lucille has passed away and she's left it to her second nephew's sister. <laughs> and that person is not coming back to Salina to take this property. And frankly, it, it, it won't necessarily affect them. It's not going to affect their credit report. There's, there's nothing demanding that they come back and deal with this house often. And so it's just going to sit there. It's going to sit there for the three years while taxes aren't paid on it. And while we eventually mow it and then we send that abatement in and it's not paid and then that's put as, you know, to the taxes and this just goes on and on for three years until it goes up for tax foreclosure. And that is not a great thing when we're talking about neighborhood fortification because this, it's the opposite of somebody goes and paints or we do streetscape improvements and we start to see neighborhood improvement. It's, it's a degrading of the neighborhood and it starts to affect everything around it. So the land bank is an opportunity to to find a way to get those properties if they're truly not wanted and not going to be cared for and to find a way to get them back to somebody. It essentially takes and rids the property of its ad valerium taxes. So if it is behind on property taxes, essentially washes them of that. And then they can go into the bank and either hang out there if you're trying to accumulate several properties or it can be resold into a development program where essentially you become a registered contractor who repairs homes, let's say it's a property with a house on it or a structure of some sort. Um, you go into a development agreement, you have a certain amount of time, certain activities that need to be met, a certain amount of milestones, and upon completion of it, essentially you got the land for free. And now we have an improved piece of property on the tax rolls doing what it should be doing. Um, one of the things that's going to be in the policy that's in front of you in January is a question of how do we judge those pieces of property? Because that home situation is a perfect one, but there are a lot of imperfect ones. We have people all the time who inherit weird little triangles of land. <laughs> My copic is shaking his head, but he knows these. I mean, they come up at closing. They're just these weird, they're weird little pieces. Those often it, with a land bank, rather than letting them just be that weird piece in the neighborhood, can be put into the land bank and then sold to an adjacent neighbor who's going to mow them, take care of them, those kinds of things. Um, so you have land that's buildable with no structures, land that is not buildable without structures, land that's got a structure but shouldn't have one. <laughs> you have land that has a structure and it should stay, um, and a few other things in between. But that policy starts to give a matrix to those. So that when a, a piece of property comes in front of the commission, which is essentially the board of trustees for the land bank, you don't feel compelled to just have to take it. The question is, does this meet our objectives? Does it, does it meet the objectives of a certain neighborhood we're trying to collect parcels in to kind of create those cluster developments? 
Does it put something back into our housing stock? Does it take care of one of those puzzle pieces? But if it doesn't, you don't have to take it. So that's, that's really what the land bank is there to do is to kind of help facilitate some of those uh, property transactions that are definitely in our infill neighborhoods. Next. So this one's an interesting one, but I thought it was worth noting because I think we're gonna see more about this over the next few months. So the Neighborhood Home Investment Act is an act in front of Congress right now it is specifically meant to deal with that gap financing issue where you've got that single family home in a neighborhood that really needs that reinvestment. But what values are around you to what really needs to be done the home is, is a gap. And this program would help with financing that. Um, it gets to that, that market that we really need help in and there aren't a lot of programs to meet that. Problem con is the program doesn't exist yet. It's waiting on Congress to act. Um, and there are unknowns. I can't tell you what the overall funding's really gonna be. Um, we, have some, we have some numbers that have been thrown out there. How long that funding is gonna be around? I don't know if it's a 10-year funding cycle, a three-year funding cycle. And so how sustainable is it? Uh, I think as far as implementation, it's definitely worth us keeping an eye on this program and it wouldn't hurt to understand maybe where our members of Congress fall on this and if they're supportive or not supportive and indicating how Salina could benefit from a program like this. Um, and then if it were adopted is also how, how, do we, how do we pair our money with it? Is there a, kind of a way to get the best bang for our buck? If we do something like a rehab or a consortium, can you take a tool like this plus that tool and make a bigger difference? A lot of this is about how do we pair some of these things together because not there's no one solution. There's no one tool that we're going to pick that fix all, fixes all of this. Next slide. One that I thought was also worth adding is ADUs or <coughs> accessory dwelling units. The Planning Commission has talked about this a bit and it's kind of an old fashioned concept. You know, the idea of having a garage with an apartment above it, um, basement apartments, um, a mother-in-law apartment, depending on your lot size, they can be very helpful for taking existing neighborhoods and finding affordability. For instance, somebody would like to stay in their home, but let's say taxes have gone up in the neighborhood or just the cost of maintaining that home is exceeded. If they had something they could rent out, it would add additional income making it easier for that person to keep that housing stock good, but also bringing kind of new life into the neighborhood. A lot of times that introduces somebody to a neighborhood who says, oh, I really like renting here, now I'd like to buy. And ideally, if we're turning over that housing stock, they'd have an opportunity to buy. Cons are usually parking. People have to be good stewards of their parking, and when they're assigned a spot, park there instead of where they shouldn't be parking. And it somehow always causes a lot of drama. And it sounds really silly, but it's a very real issue. And I think one of the things we run into with ADUs is that perception of neighborhood character. You know, our homes have always been like this. I didn't want to live next to an apartment or a rental. And it's just kind of that perception of the neighborhood. One, to do this, we need to adopt new code. Um, Planning Commission, as I said, has been talking around this topic. Um, and then we need to address the applicability details. You know, it's just, it's a lot of little things on this. How many units, how many ADUs would be allowed with the size of those ADUs, the accessibility of parking, all these types of things, and a ton of public outreach. There are a lot of conversations that need to be had, a lot of listening to understand from those communities where you'd want to up ADUs to make sure that they're comfortable with this change. Okay, next. A housing trust kind of goes hand in hand with a land bank and some of these neighborhood fortification issues that we're looking at. The trust creates an environment in which once properties are improved and they're sold, when they're sold again, a certain portion of those goes back to the trust, which then maintains those homes and keeps them at a set price. A lot of times when you start to get neighborhood fortification going well, we start to lead towards gentrification and a housing trust is set up to stabilize property prices in a neighborhood so they remain affordable and they remain stable. And it's a good way when you're first seeding a neighborhood to do that. 
I think this is a very long-term thing for us, and due to time, I'm not going to go into great detail, but I think it's worth learning a little bit more about, and it can apply both to commercial and residential. And as we start to see how these things take off, it might be worth looking at a land trust or a housing trust. And I know in working with Amanda, Lawrence has a really good example of one, and we've been in contact, and I hope to kind of go spend some time with them this spring and learn a little bit how they've used their trust along with their land bank and their CHODO to kind of get the biggest bang for their buck and help with stabilizing their housing market. Next slide, please. So of these different tools that we've talked about, I highlighted some that I think are more short term in the next 12 to 24 months. Re revamping the neighborhood revitalization plan, I think is very doable. Um, we talked about land bank and getting the policy adopted. So good, we're not even six months into the new year, and we could probably get those things done sooner rather than later. Then we've got, you know, finding that lending consortium, who would those financial partners be and what is it we're really hoping they do? Um, do we need a rehab program? Is a rehab program and the lending consortium kind of one and the same thing, or are they different? And then do we have any role in energy weatherization? Are we just marketing those programs? Are we trying to pair those programs with something like the rehab or lending consortium? Just trying to kind of understand where that fits into things and how do we take advantage of it? And then long-term, I highlighted the ADU ordinance just because I think there's a lot of conversations that need to be had with those neighborhoods before we go and do something like that. Um, there's the NHIA, which is that federal program. We don't know if it's ever gonna exist, but we can keep an eye on it. And as it does come along, how do we integrate that if that's something we wanna participate in? And then lastly, the housing trust. That's right. it. <laughs> that's a lot of information. Yeah. Any questions or comments from members of the commission? Questions, comments. Just have one. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Go. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just wondering um, if we have enough staff resources to do this as we're currently staffed, or, or should we consider having an office of housing development? You probably can't see me, but I just told Lauren, feel free to say no. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> It just, you know, given our current staffing levels, responding to uh, home inspections uh, in terms of code inspection, responding to planning and zoning, um, and some of the, the staffing shortages that we've tried to address, address by backfilling with consultants, we're doing everything we can to keep up with current workload. T initiatives like this represent a significant increase in workload. Yeah, we would definitely have to look at administrative costs. And it's no different than, you know, we get a grant to run something, and that's one of those things they ask us. What is your, you know, there's some administration money definitely needed. We'd have to look at that program, too. It would take resources. That was my number one deal. I mean, from looking at all this and trying to think it through, mm -hmm. it, it's obviously very, very labor-intensive to try to, to tie all these together. Um, question is, as far as some of these programs, size of communities that are doing this, are a lot of them larger than us because they have a separate department to help with this? Or? No, not necessarily. I mean, some of it's just, it's just where you prioritize okay. and where you want to have those. I mean, I've talked to Lions, Kansas, and they've had somebody running a rehab program with their land bank. Wyandotte County also has a rehab program. It part runs as part of its land bank. Um, consortiums come in all shapes and sizes. Like I said, Topeka's got a rehab program, very specific, um, using a different funding source. So they're they're kind of all shapes and sizes. And, and I know one of the early comments you made was obviously time and resources, um, which obviously uh, personnel is one of those. But um, is there any way we can team up with the Chodo? And I know you've been on the Chodo board to help fund some of the things they're trying to do, um, or how do we how do we try to partner with them because to me we're looking for partners and right now that's the one partnership that's out there that we might be able to to try to to match what they're trying to do with what we want to see done well and just for the record i'm no longer on the chota board yeah so um but i do i do think that uh, any partner whether it's the choto or another entity will still require administration dollars 
you know, we're still going to have to allot some money because they're going to have to. If we're not paying somebody to do it, they're going to have to pay somebody to do it. And I think for the Chodo, it's kind of a chicken or egg thing. You know, they've been doing some house flipping. I know Gary Hobby, the executive director of the Salina Chodo, is here, and he could probably better address that. But, you know, anybody's going to have to build the capacity for this. But that is definitely one way to tackle this, for sure, is looking for a partner like that to help administer these. And, you know, we, in our previous meetings, we set aside a million dollars for infill development. So when do we have that discussion of how we look for those dollars to be used? I mean, is that part of our 2022 strategic planning meeting, or is that a separate meeting between the, the com commission? It certainly can be part of the 2022 strategic planning. I think the conversation and what's going on in the community is probably going to call the question sooner than that. Yeah. Well, I think this this study session was to kind of give you an idea of these are the types of tools that are out in front of you. I, I need some help from you guys to figure out which tools do you want to pick up and run with? Where, where do you think that these are going to fit in? What parts of these did you like best? What parts do you, you think either aren't relevant or not important right now? Because, I mean, some of this is also prioritizing what we chase after. Amanda's going to be with us. Um, she's here for two years. So part of the things that we brought her in to do was to specifically to help with infill housing to kind of get me that resource. But a lot of that's going to be developing these programs. But when we look at long-term sustainability, somebody's going to have to run them. And, and one other question I had, um, and I think you mentioned it in here before, there has been some discussion of tiny homes, um, mm -hmm. which... I'm okay with tiny homes, I guess, if they're built correctly and they're, they have a long, uh, you know, lifespan. Do we currently have ordinances that affect the minimum size of, of homes and also the number of rooms or something? I don't know why I was thinking we had some, some ordinances out there that would affect that that may have to be a... We typically tell people that we don't have code that's prohibitive of tiny homes. Okay. Now, if it's on wheels, it's slightly different because it's, it's not necessarily a structure then. And so how those are being looked at. So if you've got one of these little tiny homes that people kind of pull yeah, almost like a little camper. I'm it's talking a very about different, on a foundation. Yeah. No, we can, our current building code okay, can generally accommodate a tiny home. Like when Kansas Wesleyan looked at theirs, our building uh, code accommodated that. When um, there was another like manufactured tiny home company out of Wichita, their designs as is were totally compatible with our building code. So we haven't found our code to be prohibitive in that type of construction. Any other questions or comments? Thank you so much. And I realize you're probably not getting a lot of direction, but I feel like at least two of us are a little bit hamstrung here knowing that um, we can give all the direction we want, but you may be getting completely <laughs> different direction as of January 10th. So um, I thank you for your time. Thank you for the presentation. You're welcome. It was great. Thank you. Um, I do see that we have some community stakeholders here, Gary Hobby, the executive director of the CHODO, and we also have Barb Young of North Salina Community Development. I don't want to put either one of you on the spot, but if there's anything that you'd like to add, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to do so. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor and Commissioners. We appreciate that. The Community Housing Development Corporation of Central Kansas has been running for about three years now. We've completed our seventh house and working on number eight and number nine. And we are in a transition period or a period of, we'd like to be in transition. Gary would like for the transition to happen as soon as possible. Because uh, he'd been volunteering his time for the last two or three years working on the project. But we have some opportunities that have been thrown in our lap to take on multiple houses within our community. And it's gonna take some administration. And so I'm gonna reinforce what Lauren was just talking to you about. Our organization needs some assistance financially to set up a director that can work on this on a more full-time basis rather than limited part-time basis. So we're looking for anybody who wants to partner with us to help us uh, bring on a full-time director to work with not only rental units, but housing rehabilitation, and maybe even some new, uh, when we get into some infill units and that type of thing. So we're very open to any amount of funds we can get from you to help us or anybody in our community who's willing to help us work on that. The existing funds that we have are to be designated specifically for rehabilitation of purchase, rehab, and sell to owner-occupied systems. We've not reached out into the rental side yet, but we're looking very seriously at it. 
So any assistance would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hobby. Anybody else that would like to speak to this issue before we have a brief break? Um, not seeing anyone. All right. Well, thanks again to staff for um, the presentation. We will adjourn briefly until 4 o'clock when our regular meeting begins. Thank you very much. And your daughters? Traumatized, of course. 15. All right. We are, we are live. And I'd like to welcome you to the um, December 13th, 2021 Salina City Commission meeting. Before we get started, I'd like to request confirmation that the Kansas Open Meeting Act required notice has been provided. Yes. Thank you very much. We'll proceed with roll call. Mayor Hodges. Here. Commissioner Davis. Here. <laughs> Commissioner Hoppick. Here. Did that come through? Yes, it did. Thank you. Commissioner Peck. Here. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Ryan. Here. Would those who are able please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance in a moment of silence? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and I would like to um, point out to those of you here in attendance today or those who may be watching from home that we do have an amended agenda which added a couple of executive session items to um, the end of our previously published agenda. So if you want to access that, you can access that online at the city's website. Um, let's see, no awards or proclamations. Citizens Forum. Citizens Forum is an opportunity for any member of the public to speak on an item that does not appear on today's agenda. I'd ask that you identify yourself by your first and last name, tell us where you're from, and limit your remarks to three minutes. Norman Mammoth, Salina, Kansas. Freedom of speech, to speak freely. In Blue Rapids, Kansas, there was a display of a flag and on this flag it had words I won't say it in here he repeated it twice the flag did it was considered offensive a nuisance charges were filed against this person and the court ruled freedom of speech is allowed in this country the charges were dismissed. A former president was criticized by a country and Western group several years ago. The president said they have a right to say what they want. It's called free speech. The former president said this. You've got a lot of stuff in here that is restricting our feelings, our expression of speech. They can say what they want about free speech. Anybody can. It's, it's in the Constitution. Citizen participation is the cornerstone of democracy. Something just doesn't look right here. I see trouble coming down the road. Now, about population control. As the population increases, so do our problems increase. If you want to stop these problems, we're going to have to have at least zero population control. We do not have until 2050 for zero pop or waste control. We've got about 10 years left. So 2050 ain't going to work. It isn't working. Population control is being done in China as we speak. And it works. 
but freedom of speech is our constitutional right. Thank you very much, Mr. Mantel. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? And do we have anyone online who would like to make remarks during Citizens Forum? If you would, please raise your virtual hand and we will unmute you. All right. That will take us, we'll go ahead and close the Citizens Forum and we'll move on to public hearings and items scheduled for a certain time. Item 5.1, public hearing 2021 amended budget. Ms. Pack. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Commissioners. Debbie Pack, Director of Finance. In order to amend or adopt a budget, we must hold a public hearing. And for the 2021 budget, we have three funds that are requiring an amended budget. We published notification of this hearing on December 3rd in the Salina mm -hmm. Journal. And so we'll have, today we'll have two action items. We'll have a public hearing on it, and we'll also uh, have a proposal to amend the 2021 um, budget for these three particular funds. Three funds that are requiring amendments for 2021 include the Business Improvement District Fund, which is the downtown district, um, which was established by Kansas statute. The original budget for this fund was $90,000. Um, as a result of collection, this is a pass-through fund, and as a result of collection in excess of our uh, original estimate of $90,000, uh, staff is recommending that this budget be amended to $125,000 in order for us to pass those, those revenues through to the um, downtown district. The sales tax economic De development fund was originally budgeted at $370,000. City commission approved in June of 2021, a one-time um, economic development and set in payment to SFC Global of $650,000 to come out of this fund. So staff is recommending that we increase this um, budget to $1,020,000 which is an increase of the $650,000. This amount will be, will be coming from the, t the fund balance, which will, as of 2020 was $715,686.21. The additional expenditure authority will be budgeted from this fund balance. The third fund requiring um, a, a 2021 amendment is a spa special parks fund, which is supported by special alcohol tax. The original budget for 2021 in this fund was $251,000. In August of 2021, City Commission authorized an agreement with Salina Tenants Alliance and committed the city to funding some demolition at the uh, Kenwood, Old Kenwood Pool and Rodeo Grounds in an amount of $265,000. And on December 6, 2021, City Commission authorized a, an agreement for the replacement of Lakewood Park, which committed the city to approximately $86,000 in 2021. That wasn't originally budgeted out of that fund. The total of these increases is $351,000, bringing the amended budget, proposed amended budget to $602,000. This fund had a beginning fund balance of $465,772,000, and this additional expenditure would come from that fund balance. Upon approval of the budget amendments, um, the city will certify that amended budget to the county for submission to the state. So there's two action items today. The first is conduct the public hearing and take commas from citizens on the proposed budget and then consider approval of the amended budget. I would stand for questions. Any questions for Ms. Pack? All right, thank you very much. With that, we will go ahead and open the public hearing. Um, if there are any citizens here who would like to comment on the proposed amended budget, I'd encourage you to speak now or forever hold your peace. And are there any <coughs> citizens online who would like to speak to this issue? All right, we'll bring it back to the commission for further discussion, uh, or we'll close the public hearing and then bring it back to the commission uh, for action on the amended budget. Mayor, I move we uh, approve the amended budget. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the amended budget. And uh, Vice Mayor Davis, I'll try to <laughs> pace myself so that uh, um, that we can be sure to hear from you. Um, 
All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And, aye. Okay. Sorry about that. There's a little bit of a lag. That motion passes 5-0. Um, which takes us to the consent agenda. Item 6.1, approve the minutes of December 6, 2021. Item 6.2, authorize the city manager to sign an agreement with SCS engineers for professional engineering services for the Salina Municipal Solid Waste Landfill. Item 6.3, authorize the city manager to execute specialty contractor agreements with Plains Environmental Services, Inc. and GSI Engineering, LLC for remedial design phase two drilling support at the former Schilling Air Force Base site. Are there any items that a commissioner would like to have removed from the consent agenda? Vice Mayor Davis, are you okay with that? I'm okay. All right. Um, then I, I would entertain a motion to approve. Mayor Hodges, I move we approve consent agenda items 6.1, 6.2, and 6.3. Second. We have a motion and a second to present the, or to approve the consent agenda as presented. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And that motion passes 5-0. Aye. Okay. <laughs> you got about a ten All right. Sorry. I'm going to, I'm going to, obviously I'm not getting the timing down, but I'll hopefully I'll improve by the end of the meeting and um, uh, we'll, we'll get everybody voting at the, at the same time. Um, item 7.1. Item 7.1, approve resolution number 21-8005, amending fees in the 2022 comprehensive fee schedule related to solid waste and sanitation and establishing water and wastewater rates effective January 1, 2022. Ms. Pack. Good afternoon, Debbie Pack, Director of Finance. As a result of the November 8th and 20, uh, November 22nd study sessions presented by Public Works, we are presenting today the recommendations for um, increases to the 2022 comprehensive fee schedule related to tipping fees at the landfill. After further review, staff identified additional fees related to the tipping fees that subsequently needed adjusting. The uh, fees that are being recommended have been provided in the staff report. <coughs> Annually, this. Uh, the finance staff works with the utilities department to present to you an annual um, analysis of water um, rates. This annual review was presented to city commission at a December 6, 2021 study session. The recommendation at that time was to increase fees, water fees, 3% annually. This resolution is, goes in, is, would go into effect on January 1, 2022. The options uh, provided to city commission today would be to adopt the resolution amending this, the comprehensive fee schedule for solid waste and sanitation fees, and also to provide for water and wastewater rates effective January 1st, 2022. Commission could also approve this with amendments as you seem appro deem appropriate. You could postpone consideration of the resolution to a specific time, or you could not approve resolution 21-08005 leaving the rates as established under the previous resolutions. Staff recommends option number one. I would stand for questions. I also have Martha Tasker from Utilities here and Jim Toich and Jim Coach from Public Works. If you have any specific questions about any of the rates or the proposed rates um, for the amendment to the, to the comprehensive fee schedule. Thank you. Are there any questions for Ms. Pack from members of the commission? And Are then, we still taking tires? Yes. And that, no. that, fee, I have to look back there. that fee would remain the same. It doesn't fall under any of these. And then the commercial yard waste, that's the, the limb, basically the limb area. Okay. Um, and I, I think the question I had, um, and I can't remember if it was from the study session, the recent study session, but we're anticipating um, the 3% um, increases for for water charges that's kind that's going out at least through we project that out through the first five years however we do know that we looked at the, we look at that right. annually and that number can change as we look at it from year to year right um, but we do anticipate that number not to go down for sure um, okay but yeah that would be our analysis at this point would be three percent annually okay 
All right, thank you. Any questions or comments from members of the public? Good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, John Blanchard, Salina. Uh, I seem to recall a year ago or sometime in about that time frame when there was a discussion about water rates. And at that time, the concern was is that with the $40 million new water treatment facility, that the fees were going to continue to go up. And I believe the information at the time was that they, they fi figured out that it, we weren't going to have to raise rates at 3%. At, the t at that time, the rate of inflation was about 1.5% max. And there, was, there were comments made about that. Is there, is there any recollection of what happened between then and now to where the, the language back then was not that oh, at least 3% for the foreseeable future. The language back then was, hey, we got good news. It doesn't look like we're going to have to raise rates um, the amount that we had previously thought. So just curious if some, something changed, and if so, what changed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think, I think that's why I keep coming back to that, that question about the 3% annual uh, increase in, in the fees, just because at some point deep in my mind, I... I thought we were um, accounting for maybe holding rates steady with projected account growth or something. But yeah, if you, if you can speak to that, that would be great, Debbie. I will, I will address that as far as my recollection and yeah. what we provided to you last year was when we raised rates last year at 2%, uh, a lot of the conversation was we're in the middle of COVID, what can we do to help this? And, and our conversation was, Let's do this this year. 2% increase is not as high as it normally has been, which has been anywhere from 3 to 4.5% in the past four to five years. Um, knowing and projecting that that fund balance was going to go negative within the first five years. Um, so that's what we're trying to level out at this point, is we're trying to level out that fund balance to go out a little farther out, as, as far out as we can get. Um, even with the, the projections that we have today, um, fund balance will go very low within the next 10 years. So we'll be looking at either, we know that our growth in, um, our assumption in growth in uh, accounts is only about 0.1%. Um, our, our usage, we actually reduced our usage um, assumptions in 2022 um, because we were looking at some, the trend of what that was doing. So that has all had an effect on what, how those rates are going to be able to sustain those huge um, projects that we have coming out. I will say as we get out into about 2031 or 2032, some of the debt that we're seeing from earlier projects, the meter project will drop off. It's not a significant amount, but we, we hope that at that point, the fund balance then will be able to start recovering itself, but we don't know what inflation's gonna do or the cost of these projects is gonna be, to, to be quite honest at this point. I hope Thank that you. helps. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments from members of the public? Any questions or comments from members of the public who are participating online? And not seeing any raised hands, I'll bring it back to the commission for further discussion or action. Mayor, I move we adopt resolution number 21. 8005, amending solid waste and sanitation fees as recommended and amending the comprehensive fee schedule to provide for water and wastewater rates effective January 1st, 2022. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve resolution number 21-8005. Um, all in favor, I guess we'll take a deep breath here, say aye. 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 Any opposed? And that motion passes 5 0. <coughs> um, item 7.2. Item 7.2 approve ordinance number 21 11093, levying Salina Business Improvement District number one service fees for 2022. Ms. Pack. Thank you. I'm trying to get all mine out early. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
the Salina Business Improvement District was formed um, under Statute 12-1781, um, covering certain downtown areas of Salina. It's a fee collected by those areas and provides services to those um, retailers in that particular area. Uh, uh, and annually, by ordinance, the city must adopt, um, levy the fees for those particular, um, that particular district upon recommendation of the BID board. The BID board for 2022 has um, recommended a 0% increase. This is the second year in a row that they're <coughs> proposing a 0% increase. Um, so this um, ordinance number 22 or 21-11093 levying Salina Business Improvement District service fees for 2022 will not change the fees for the downtown retailers. Options for you to, is to approve the ordinance on first reading, approve it with amendments as you deem necessary, postpone consideration of this ordinance, um, approve on first reading and provide us direction if you need any further um, information or vote to deny the ordinance um, adopting the fees for the improvement district. I did hand you because the blue sheet said there was an attached map. I did hand you prior to the meeting that attached map just so that you'd have it if you had any questions. I would stand for any questions. Questions from the commission? No. no. Um, all right, any, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any questions or comments from members of the public? And any questions or comments from members of the public who are participating online? If not, I'll bring it back to the commission for action. Mayor Hodges, I move we approve ordinance number 21-11093, levying Salina Business Improvement District number one service fees for 2022. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve ordinance number 21-11093. All in favor say aye. 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 And any opposed? All right, I'm going to I'm going to assume that was 5-0, Vice Mayor, so correct me if I if I didn't catch your response. On video his hand went up and his lips moved, but I didn't hear any. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, item 7.3. Item 7.3, approve ordinance number 21-11092 on second reading, changing the zoning classification of artistic nails and spa from R1 to C3 district. Ordinance number 21-11092 was passed on first reading on December 6, 6, 2021. Since that time, no comments have been received. Are there any questions or comments from the commission? Are there any questions or comments um, on this ordinance from members of the public? And if not, I'll bring it back to the commission for action. Mayor, I move we approve ordinance number 21-11092 on second reading. Second. We have a motion and a second and a second to approve ordinance number 21-11092 on second reading. Could we have a roll call, please? <coughs> Commissioner Davis. Aye. Commissioner Hoppick. Aye. Commissioner Peck. Aye. Commissioner Ryan. Aye. Mayor Hodges. Aye. That motion passes 5-0. Item 7.4. Item 7.4, approve resolution number 21-8004, expressing support of the governing body of the City of Salina for the redevelopment <coughs> of Memorial Hall into an eSports arena and multi-purpose facility. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Scrag, will you be taking this line? I'm sorry, my microphone okay. was off. Actually, Mr. Wood is, is online, and I think he's prepared to make the presentation. All right. Thank you. Mr. Wood, we'll turn it over to you. Is he muted? You don't have him on the line anymore? Okay, maybe we've dropped Mr. Wood. I will make okay. a presentation. Okay. Um, commissioners, I, I think you recall that we had a conversation uh, not that long ago about uh, the possibility of redeveloping Memorial Hall, uh, which is city owned and, and maintained. Um, Hutton Group approached you on October 11th of this year and they presented a concept for the possibility of an eSports arena and uh, coupling that with possible additional uses for public event space and banquet space and space for rent. 
um, those type of things. The somewhat in keeping with other public-private partnership approaches that we've taken, um, the, the we had a conversation about passing a resolution of support, indicating your initial support, giving uh, Hutton enough confidence to invest some additional time and energy in a concept, um, and you instructed staff to bring back that resolution of support for your consideration. So that's what's on your agenda today. Um, I, it's not a full-blown commitment, but it is enough of an indication to Hutton that that uh, it you have uh, understand understand the concept and have enough receptivity to it to allow them to proceed. A few highlights of the uh, the resolution itself, just to clarify a few points, is uh, in in the uh, resolution you express uh, your appreciation, vision, and and the work of the Hutton uh, company. You express your desire to pursue a public and private partnership with them uh, for redevelopment of Memorial Hall into a eSports arena and multi-use facility. You indicate your willingness to consider transfer of Memorial Hall to Hutton Co Corporation for $1 subject to certain reversionary conditions uh, once they've further established a redevelopment plan that will include a list of intended uses, redevelopment timeline and budget, and further details regarding the nature of the public-private partnership. And it's anticipated that Hutton will request property tax incentives, um, including but not, not limited to industrial revenue bonds, uh, neighborhood revitalization, uh, tax rebates, and a possibility of a community improvement district, and that the city would consider any application but makes no guarantee of any approval of any financial incentives by way of approving this resolution, and that you're instructing staff uh, with the assistance of legal counsel to make preparations for your approval. Uh, out in the future if this comes to fruition. Um, and then in recognition of Hutton's financial commitment uh, towards the plan uh, for presentation to you within a reasonable time, we will not solicit other alternative redevelopment proposals while they have some time to pursue this opportunity. Um, so that's essentially the the uh, mechanics or the uh, the highlights of what's included in the resolution in response to their presentation to you in, Octo in October and your direction to staff to uh, proceed in this manner. Uh, much like any other, so uh, as far as fiscal note, there's no direct uh, cost to us at this time. Um, it does contemplate the possibility of property tax abatement if we can come to agreement on a redevelopment plan. And like many other uh, items, uh, your options include approving the resolution as it's presented, uh, approving it with amendments as you deem appropriate. You could postpone consideration and provide direction to staff or Hutton about additional information that you'd like to take into consideration, or you could vote to deny the resolution in its entirety. Um, Mike King I'm, is here from, from Hutton. Um, I want to make sure to acknowledge him and give him the opportunity to address you, but staff recommends option number one at this time. All right. Um, thank you very much. I think that um, we will um, ask uh, Mr. King from Hutton if, if, you, if there are any remarks that you would like to give today to invite you forward and have the opportunity to make those remarks uh, before we start with any questions um, uh, for staff. All right, well, thank you. My name is Mike King, Vice President with Hutton Corporation. We appreciate your willingness to continue further discussions in this. Um, the, my only thought would be if there is some question around what what designates a reasonable amount of time, uh, we're looking in the six month time frame to have something back to you uh, by that point. Okay. So that would be my only thoughts and considerations. We're really excited about this uh, and um, uh, this has generated some interest uh, from across the state as well, I will say. All right, well thank you very much. Appreciate it, appreciate the work that you're putting, that you're putting into this at this time. So um, that addressed my question in terms of what is considered a, a reasonable amount of time and, and from your time frame it's looking like six months. Okay. Um, questions for either, oh, I'm sorry, um, Vice Mayor Davis. Yeah, I realize that in section three there are no guarantees of any financial incentives, uh, but in what form will the city commission uh, meet to negotiate or, or consider uh, which incentives might be be offered or is any advance thoughts on how that will work out um, I think it really starts with Hutton's vision and, and their proposal as they bring it forward 
that then might dictate what type of incentives they, they have in mind, which um, for an IRB process, we'd, we'd follow that um, very potentially would include the EDO to review it and make a recommendation. Uh, the neighborhood revitalization program is, if it's within the, the, the provisions of that program, it's really kind of an entitlement program. It doesn't take a lot of uh, additional review and approval. We Staff could assist in processing that. If it were a community improvement district, there's a very detailed process associated with petitioning for that and, and public notices, and we'd, we'd have to follow those particular steps. Thank you. Any other questions for staff or for Mr. King? Um, my only remaining question would be um, if we did have an alternative redevelopment proposal for Memorial Hall that presented itself independent of um, our re you know, request or solicitations, does this resolution um, in the way it's written, prohibit us from entering into some kind of negotiations or conversations for an alternative use that comes to us as opposed um, for from the, from the city soliciting such a redevelopment proposal? I mean, does this mean that this is exclusive for six months and we won't entertain any, any proposals that may be brought? Yeah, unsolicited, unsolicited. is your question? Yes. Um, I think we'd certainly have that conversation. Um, my just, my initial reaction would be that we'd uh, follow up with Hutton, find out where they're at, what their timeline looks like, whether the project's moving forward, and we kind of have to, to balance those. But this language does talk about us soliciting them in the event that we had a proposal. I think we'd try to na navigate that um, with Hutton in terms of not necessarily disclosing details of a proposal that would be inappropriate, but touching base with them in terms of where they're at in their process and their timeline, and then we'd have to respond accordingly. All right, thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from members of the public? I'm gonna get my money's worth today. So John Blanchard, Salina. Um, first of all, I'd like to say I'm uh, supportive of this initiative because it is a nice reuse of an historic building that we have in town. Um, and any time we can do an adaptive reuse, reuse such as that, I think it's great. I'm thankful that uh, Mr. King and Hutton has stepped up to do this. One thing, and it's related to the question that you had, Mayor, and the question that the Vice Mayor had. Uh, when I was reading through this proposal, the thing that I got stuck on was the agreement to sell the property for $1. Um, I don't know if the city, I thought the city had a petition process that the city commission had to declare park property or other property surplus and go through a petition period um, to make sure that does. And, and in the form of tripping hazards, that could be a tripping hazard if we have, if, if that um, is in fact the case. I don't know what, what Memorial Hall is classified as, but I do know that it was used for parks and rec purposes. So don't know if it's considered a park or what, what the classification is. As to Vice Mayor uh, Davis's <coughs> question about incentives, and we went through this when we were doing the downtown project. And whenever we're involved in a public-private partnerships, a partnership, and we start saying, well, the public side offers this amount of equivalent in funding and the private side has this. I long contended that we needed to be keeping track of how much parking lots were valued when we were giving away land for the uh, field house. And w we never kept track of any of that stuff. So I think if we're gonna do a true public-private partnership and we wanna be completely transparent with taxpayers and ensure t taxpayers that this really is a good deal for us, and I think it is, regardless of what the, what the cost we place on the value of that building is. I think, I think we get more public buy-in and more public support when we provide that level of transparency and say, taxpayer dollars, have a lot have gone into maintaining that building for years and years and years and years. To say it's only worth one dollar of value, I think is discounting the level of commitment taxpayers have shown in the past. 
So I hope that you'll consider those. Um, I hope that you'll also consider it in the spirit I'm giving it as in, have we made sure that we don't have tripping hazards that would get in the way of, of seems to be a promising and aggressive timeline uh, by Hutton. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sprague, could you speak to um, uh, our DAC session of um, either park, poly, park um, property or um, excess uh, city property? I mean, where does this, where exactly does this fall? Well, I may be putting the city attorney on uh, okay. legal counsel on the spot, but as we've staffed this through, we've not identified this as a park. It is park specific. There is a statute specific to park property. And so I don't know that we've identified this as being subject to that requirement. Mr. Bankston. Sure, Mayor and Commissioners. The uh, statute that addresses that is uh, <coughs> KSA 12 1301, and it tells us that in order to sell property uh, that has been used for park purposes or as a public square or as a public market, uh, I believe is the language used, uh, does require the process that you all are familiar with, with uh, the petition and the prospect for a uh, referendum. The, um, the question posed, uh, to this point, we had not viewed that as having been for park purposes. Um, and it's my understanding that that would literally translate into use as a as a park in the more uh, traditional sense, um, as opposed to the uses that, uh, albeit Parks and Recreation Department, have uh, applied to that structure. Um, I'm, as you can tell, I'm kind of processing that as we <laughs> speak. Uh, we had not. That question had not been posed, and, and I frankly had not raised it, uh, although being certainly familiar with the proposed transaction. So um, I suppose we can evaluate that other than just here uh, mm -hmm. and look at that more carefully. But that's the, uh, the statutory test is uh, use as a park, a public square, or a public market. Gotcha. But, I, you know, given the amount of time and, and effort and, and money that, that Hutton has put into the project already, if we could anticipate something like that and make sure that they have a definitive answer so that they are well aware of how the process is going to play out and don't get blindsided, you know, at the last minute with, you know, an oh, oh by the way, this is a process that we need to follow. I think that, that, um, I think that would be good for, for both parties. Concerned. Yeah. To if have it's helpful, that. if you, definitive. on the assumption that you pass it, we can certainly staff that through further and provide a definitive answer. Yeah. Um, with respect to the the one dollar, you know, I think I don't think we're representing that the building is worth a dollar. That is a contribution to the project, and we can um, try to work towards <clears throat> quantifying that in some way. Um, that building has not been in, in full use for quite some time. It has represented a maintenance obligation, um, but we can try to quantify that value. Thank you. Any other um, uh, questions or comments from members of the public? And I don't see anyone with their hands raised online either, so I'll bring it back to the commission for further discussion or action. Mayor Hodges, I move we approve resolution number 21-8004 expressing support of the governing body of the city of Salina for the redevelopment of Memorial Hall into an e-sports arena and multi-purpose facility. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve resolution number 21-8004, expressing support of the governing body for the redevelopment of Memorial Hall into an e-sports arena and multi-purpose facility. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
That motion passes 5-0. And I think, you know, if we could get an update in terms of the deaccession policy for this, this that applies to this, <coughs> that would be um, helpful for, for everyone involved. And Mr. King, thank you again so much. And please convey our thanks to everyone at, at Hutton for being willing to take a look at repurposing Memorial Hall for something that could could potentially bring a lot of excitement and a lot of energy um, to a building that hasn't seen a lot of that in, in the last few decades. So thank you. Thank you. Item 7.5. Item 7.5, authorize the purchase of electrical equipment for the Salina Police Department facility and to conduct a competitive bid process for installation of the equipment and retrofit lights to LED in an amount not to exceed $94,195. Mr. Hammond. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, Jeff Hammond, Interim Director of Parks and Recreation. Uh, before you is a request to authorize the purchase of electrical equipment, electrical equipment to con and to conduct a competitive bid process for the installation of that equipment and retrofit lights to LED for the Salina Police Department. Uh, the facilities superintendent and I will come back to you at a future date with the results of that competitive competitive bid process for the electrical installation. Uh, the facilities maintenance division. Uh, for the city of Salina is responsible for uh, city buildings and custodial services and is under Parks and Recreation. Thus, I, I'm before you today. Uh, the Salina Police Department building at 255 North 10th Street was opened in 1967 and has the original 600 amp service. The facility is staffed 24 hours a day uh, for operations and houses emergency communication equipment and would be categorized as a critical operation for the city. In 2015, an electrical evaluation was done by Henderson Engineers, um, which showed the original existing electrical distribution board uh, was manufactured by Federal Pacific. Uh, it is old and in poor condition. Uh, replacement parts and breakers are not available, and uh, electrical subpanels are cited as a potential safety concern. Uh, the short-term recommendation that was provided by Henderson Engineers <coughs> uh, identified installing some metering uh, on panels and, and tracing of all the circuits. Uh, the facilities maintenance staff completed this in 2019 by having a contractor install that data logging to measure and record electrical data. Uh, this data was crucial to meet the long-term requirement, which was to replace the existing panels uh, with new and upgraded electrical service and distribution boards. Uh, facilities and maintenance spent a significant amount, significant amount of time researching the electrical equipment that would fit inside the existing electrical cabinets. Uh, the current electrical panels are encased in mortar and block and cannot be removed without doing a major renovation. <clears throat> the proposed equipment is, uh, from, is Square D equipment from American Electric Company at a cost of $18,350. Uh, these new panels will be retrofit into those existing <laughs> panels. And the estimated cost for installation is $25,000. Uh, additionally, as part of this proposal, staff requests to replace 200, 293 existing light fi fixtures in the police station to LED uh, at a cost of $43,950, which includes installation. Uh, as already stated, a competitive bid process uh, will, be will be conducted for the installation of the electrical equipment and the LED lights uh, with the results and recommendations brought to you for approval. Uh, the estimated total of this project is $94,195, and that would be funded from the building and facilities sub-CIP. The original budget for this is $120,000. Uh, staff has identified the following options for your consideration. Um, step one, or option one, authorize the purchase of the electrical equipment and to conduct a competitive, competitive bid process for installation of the said electrical equipment and LED lights. <coughs> authorized with amendments as authorized with amendments as the city commission deems appropriate for the purchase of that electrical equipment and to conduct a competitive process 
for the installation of the electrical equipment. And three, postpone consideration for the purchase and to conduct a competitive bid process for the installation. And four, deny the purchase and installation of the electrical equipment for the police facility. Uh, staff recommends option number one. Uh, and I'll stand for any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. Any questions for Mr. Hammond? Yeah, I just had one question. Um, and again, this is a facility that's open 24 hours a day, so I'm guessing a lot of these fixtures are on uh, continuously. Uh, was there any uh, qu um, ask as far as what the annual savings will be by switching to LEDs to? Uh... I did not look into that. Uh, okay. and I did, it was a, a question was posed, but it was not okay. a data we were able to get. I just think it'd be interesting to know what our annual savings is as we recoup some of the costs. So I was, just didn't know if anyone had addressed that. Any other questions for Mr. Hammond? Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any questions or comments from members of the public? Hearing none, um, we'll bring it back to the commission for action. Mayor, I move we authorize the purchase of electrical equipment and to conduct <clears throat> a competitive bid process for installation of said electrical equipment and LED lights with the results and recommendation brought to the City Commission for approval at a future date for the amount not to exceed $94,195. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 <coughs> Any opposed? And that motion passes 5-0. Item 7.6. Item 7.6, consider construction bid award for city project number <coughs> 21028 for water, sanitary sewer, street, and drainage improvements in Cedar Ridge Edition Phase 2 to TNR construction of Salina in the amount of $616,945.49 with a 5% construction contingency for a total project authorization not to exceed $647,792.76 and authorize the city manager to execute a contract with TNR construction upon fulfillment of all prerequisites under the bid documents. Mr. Stack. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Commissioners. A few months ago, we were here talking about this project for authorizing uh, the advisability and resolution for that on September 27th and just building basically a 17 lots or 13 lot subdivision here, phase two of Cedar Ridge um, that's been around for quite a while and finally building out the next phase of that. <clears throat> and at the time, definitely the, um, uh, the, the, the costs are higher. It's a smaller, smaller group of houses and fairly larger lots and quite a bit of money to put the infrastructure in. So we talked about uh, the costs and the kind of the higher specials that were proposed here. It was a concern. So it's uh, even more concerning since we only got one bid. So that was uh, not a good situation for any of us. Um, but I guess we did get one bid from the uh, TNR construction here in Salina. They are a um, pretty reputable contractor. Been doing quite a few of these now. They're currently working on Wheatland Valley finished up Stone Lake, uh, Magnolia Hills. So it seems like they're kind of getting this part of their um, <coughs> construction experience is, and is getting better and they're getting better at, at doing these projects. However, with uh, the bid market and the bid environment, I guess we're not surprised to see higher costs, but it is just concerning um, with the costs that we did see. So it's really, most of it's m related to water and sewer which Martha can attest, it's really mm -hmm. hard to bid one of those projects right now with the cost of, of pipe um, materials for those pipes. It seems like the other stuff, you know, concrete and asphalt and some of those things are fairly, fairly I shouldn't say normal, but they're not. People can kind of, um, a contractor can kind of project what that's gonna be. So it's, it's something, they're not taking a lot of risk there. Well, with, with water and sewer right now, it seems like they're taking on more risk. It's very volatile. It's hard to guarantee prices for very long. They're really not getting guarantees on prices at all in some cases. So it's, it's more risky. And I think that's why we didn't see other bidders, I guess. We talked to a few of them and we got, you know, lots of different 
thoughts on why they weren't weren't bidding. Um, I put a lot of that in here, this blue sheet. But bottom line is, I guess the bid is eight percent above, eight point six percent above the engineer's estimate. It still seems reasonable. We're glad that at this point, with um, TNR bidding on the project, that it is within something that the cools feel like they can they can deal with. Um, so they've proposed with this um, overage they would not um, assess the engineering fees, which saves um, enough money to keep the resolution of advisability the same, and the assessments are the same as originally um, projected back in September, or yeah, September. So that's the, uh, at this point, the engineer, Caw Valley, uh, did write us a letter on why things were a little bit higher or what they thought the, the idea was, but they still felt like it's a good bid and um, recommended the bid be awarded as well. So from staff's perspective and the cool's perspective and our perspective, we feel like this is, it's worth awarding this bid and moving on with this project. So I will um, uh, answer questions. Any questions for Mr. Stack? Of course, when TNR Construction bid this, they they were expecting other bidders. So that's true. Yeah, we had Smoky Hill, Smoky Hill on there. Um, APAC was on there. Another, like I said, four. I think Wayne said there was four. Yeah, four contractors were holding plans. So yeah, they were throwing a good number at it. We felt like yeah, it's a fair number. And then they were very. Um, Concerned that we'd even award it just because they said, yeah, it's they hope they're hoping it gets awarded as soon as possible so they can lock in some of these prices. So they wanted us to they wanted us here last week, but we didn't. It's uh, they're interested in and doing the doing the work and trying to get their prices locked in. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Stack? Thank How did I've got one question? How did you talk to him about the erosion control blankets? Mm -hmm. And what, what was what was the discrepancy? Is that all local stuff going out there? It, or it doesn't matter, but I, it seems like that'd be a pretty quick call from either us or them to confirm prices on that. Yeah, that was, um, I guess, a lump sum item that Eros that um, Caw Valley had in there before. And we have, uh, that was an addition uh, later that they di didn't update their bid on, basically, or their estimate on. I think if they would have done that, that would have helped us because that wouldn't have been quite as 66%, I guess, is what that number was over. Um, we've just had trouble with, we pretty much try to erosion control fabric everything instead of just um, putting the wattles and no, no one really uses silt fence, it doesn't work very well. So the erosion control fabric gets us the best product um, to get grass started. And so that's, that is more, more costly for them, and it's, but it's something that we've been utilizing in all the other subdivisions, so it felt like we have to use it here as well. So it's, they didn't, uh, Caw Valley did not have that originally in there. Um, kind of thought it was more expensive, basically, but it is something that they're, they understand why we felt like we needed it. We do have a local supplier of that, which does help. Um, the, the, I can't remember the name of the company at the airport, but it, that's been helpful because it's they manufacture a lot of it. It's easy to get. It has a cost to it, but it's it's not something that we have to worry about volatile pricing on. It's just making sure we get all the the areas covered with um, fabric to uh, keep it from eroding in the street and keep the subdivision looking good. All right. Any um, I noticed that the applicant is here. If there's anything that. I don't want to put you on the spot, but if there is anything that you want to say, you're more than you're more than welcome to um, approach the podium and, and <coughs> let us know anything that that you think we should know. Sure, <clears throat> Stephanie Cool, uh, 1531 North Burma Road, Salina, representing Cedar Ridge Development, and we would like to ask that you do um, vote to approve this award. We do recognize, as you all do, that the costs have come in significantly higher than what we had projected, but we are making a you know, we are going to be foregoing the um, engineer fees, as uh, he indicated, and we are also reevaluating the costs of the lots in light of the fact that the specials have come in um, higher than what we had anticipated. But um, we would like to get this project going, um, get these prices locked in, and, and get the project done. This is the, the smallest of the three phases of development that we'll be doing, and um, hopefully we won't have these kind of costs moving forward. But we do ask that you approve that. Do you have any questions for me? or? Any questions for Ms. Cool? Thank you very much. Thanks. Appreciate it. 
Any questions or comments from members of the public? Thank you. And seeing none, we'll bring it back to the commission for further discussion or action. Mayor, I move we approve the construction bid award for City Cedar Ridge additional phase two to TNR construction in the amount of six hundred and sixteen thousand nine hundred and forty five and forty nine cents with a thirty thousand eight hundred and forty seven and twenty seven cent five percent construction contingency for a total project authorization not to exceed six hundred and forty seven thousand seven hundred ninety two uh, dollars and seventy six cents and authorize the city manager to execute a contract with TNR construction upon fulfillment of all prerequisites under the bid doc documents. Second. We have a motion and a second to award the construction bid for city project number 21028. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And that motion passes 5-0. Good luck with your project, Ms. Cool. Item 7.7. .7. Item 7.7, .7, approve resolution number 21-8003, addressing conclusions reached and intended next steps to further address the issues and concerns highlighted by review of the use of admin leave time by exempt line of fire department personnel. All right, Mr. Scrag. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, last week, you received a report from staff regarding this topic. Uh, you also met in an executive session, and coming out of the executive session, instructed staff to prepare a resolution with really two intents. One, to formalize uh, the conclusions or, or place on record uh, what had taken place to date. And then secondly, to identify next steps to, uh, as far as proceeding forward. So the attached resolution, um, contains quite a bit of verbiage from the staff report that was presented to you last week. Uh, the whereas is uh, kind of walk you through step-by-step uh, step, um, what occurred. And then in the uh, resolution portion of it, there's two sections. One uh, is a conclusion on your part that a thorough and objective review of the use of admin leave within the department has been conducted with the assistance of a third-party forensic accounting investigator and the communication and implementation of a departmental executive time leave approach in 2007 was a significant contributing factor to the use and administration of admin leave within the department, which was a major consideration of the city manager and city manager's designees as they reviewed the matter in general, as well as considered individual personnel matters on a case-by-case -case basis. And then uh, secondly, um, there is the, the second section that says city staff is hereby instructed to review staffing levels, work assignments, position descriptions, employee classifications, and leave policies of the Salina Fire Department as described in the whereas as above and return a report uh, to the recommending to the governing body at or prior to its regular meeting February 28th of 2022. Um, that, that's about 60 days out, recognizing this is a pressing matter. Um, we, we're committed to trying to move this along, but there's quite a bit to be uh, researched, discussed, and, and, and prepared for future consideration. Uh, with respect to the fiscal note, um, don't know at this point, uh, and do expect that if there's changes made, there will be costs associated with those changes, and we'll need to quantify those, but it really depends on uh, the recommendations and how we carry those forward in the near future. Um, uh, with that, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. This has been a significant community conversation. I recognize that this has been a difficult conversation. It's uh, placed the fire department in a difficult position. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, there, there were initial uh, conclusions and, and on the part of many that as we went through this investigation, additional details shed light on it. Um, tried to provide you last week uh, a thorough discussion of that in terms of w what process we've been through, what information was gathered, the conclusions that were reached. Um, as I indicated in that staff report, um, I was not prepared to say that there was fraud on the part of in individual uh, fire fi fighters or battalion chiefs in light of the fact that they were using admin leave on the basis of direction that was provided in 2007. Um, th then I also did share with you that even taking that into account, there was review uh, conducted on a case-by-case -case basis uh, relative to that direction that was provided. So with that, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions that you might have. Questions for Mr. Scrag? 
Um, first, of, first of all, I just want to make clear that we have 80 some Salina Fire Department officers on duty. What we're talking about in this instance is eight members of a, a very, very large department. So before I get started with any questions that I have, I just want to make that very clear to the public that um, this use of administrative leave affects uh, a very small uh, percentage of our firefighters and it affects um, the firefighters who are in an exempt or salaried position. And I guess this question, I don't know if it's for the members of the governing body or for, for Mr. Scragg, but if we adopt this resolution today, I'm assuming that that means that it marks a conclusion to our investigation? Correct. And that assumes that um, we will not be pursuing any civil or criminal charges against um, any of the employees who used the admin leave time or against the former fire chief uh, Mulliken who authored the memo. Um, I, the resolution in itself doesn't necessarily preclude that, but and just by the way that it's worded, but based on our prior conversations, I believe, yes, that's the intent. Okay, that, I mean, I, that's, that's just what I'm trying to, to get a sense of so that um, members of the public know where, where things stand um, at this point. Um, thank you. And Mayor, you raise a good point about the number and relative to the, the department. And one of the points made last week in my staff report was um, you know, the, this investigation dated back to 2007. And so when we say there's eight that ha were able to use admin leave, that is dating back to 2007 includes, you know, people that retired between 2007 and today. And so um, doesn't necessarily represent eight uh, individuals that are currently employed by the city. Um, and I, this, maybe this is a philosophical question that can't be answered today. Maybe it's a philosophical question that is better discussed in our executive session for later today. But um, I guess the only question that I'm left with is if a member of executive staff establishes a policy that's in direct conflict with our own adopted policies and then their employees follow that, that policy, we're essentially, I mean, everybody walks away from that. Um, uh, the administrator that established the non-conforming policy, I mean, because I do hear you about firefighters having been given this memo and it's a very official looking memo but does that empower all the other department heads when they see something that in the personnel policies that they don't like, that they can just establish their own interdepartment rules and that's okay? Uh, it certainly does not. It, we've had that conversation. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't give them the ability to do that with impunity. Um, we would just have to, it, it, in the instance that, <coughs> that occurred, uh, we'd have to deal with it on a case by case basis. Um, you know, I'm, uh, without going into great detail, without putting words in, in any individual's mouth, um, mm -hmm. there, there was the, an executive leave policy that was the starting point of what they promulgated, but um, yeah, that would be subject mm -hmm. to it, uh, quite a bit of scrutiny as to whether it fully complied with the intent. Right, and whether, without getting into personnel, but um, whether or not the use of either that executive leave policy um, statement or with former Chief Mulliken's memorandum, 2007 memorandum about using that executive leave policy, whether or not the actions of our employees um, aligned with the, um, the guidelines within either of those documents. Um, that's all I have. 
um, are there any members of the public that have questions or comments on this issue? John Blanchard, Salina. <clears throat> I don't know where to start on this other than to say, like you did, Mayor, um, and also for the folks watching at home, I was on this city commission for almost five years. Every single action I took in regard to the fire department was to do everything I could possibly do to support their mission that everyone goes home. I think they are an honorable group. I think they got bad leadership, and I think that bad leadership has gotten us to where we are now. I want to ask a quick, quick question, because I, heard, I read things and heard things in the meeting last week that, I, th that came out of nowhere. First of all is that you characterize this as a complaint was made which triggered an investigation. The audit report from the forensic auditor, which I'm assuming we paid about $100,000 to, indicated that it started with the city. It didn't start with the complaint, which goes to a whistleblower. The whistleblower, to my understanding, was recruited by city staff to look into this thing. We, and I've said, I'm not going to say anything really more than I did last time because I don't want to wade in on personnel issues because whether they knew or didn't know, I, I give them typically the benefit of the doubt. I also give former Captain LePage the benefit of the doubt that he was doing what he felt was best. But I, I'll, I said it before and I'll say it again. One of the things that really bothers me the most is that you went, you knew about this in October of 2019, you went to your fire chief and told him about it and said, don't tell anyone. He is a leader of men who are risking their lives on a daily basis. That requires an enormous amount of trust. And you're asking him to violate the trust that his men have in him. I think that's unconscionable. I think that is a direct it shows a really lack of good leadership. And that then, so that was in February of 2020. You guys went into executive session in March of 2020 and decided, wow, we need to look into this. What's going on? Did any of you at that time even make the suggestion of, hey, we got something wrong here. Is it criminal or is it personnel? You never, you have never disclosed that. You also had an executive session in August or September of 2020 and said, hey, uh, we need to start phase one of this investigation. And then in January after that of 2021, oh, we need to start phase two. Well, according to you, you had blown through $100,000 of taxpayer dollars before the auditor uncovered the fact that, hey, in our interviews with battalion chiefs, they brought up the fact that there was an ex executive leave memo. My question to you is this. If you had told Chief Royce what was going on and let him be the leader that you hired him to be, how long do you think it would have taken for one of those battalion chiefs to say, wait a second, we're not doing anything wrong. Chief Mulliken, here's, here's the memo. You would have found that memo be six months before you hired an auditor. You wasted $100,000 of hard-earned taxpayer dollars going on some wild goose chase, according to you, it was a wild goose chase because, oh, hey, it was simply a memo. We just overlooked a memo. You wasted $100,000 there. How much is the attorneys costing us now? Another fifty dollars to $100,000 to, oh, hey, let's, let's keep us out of this. Let's, let's figure out what we need to do to make this all better and go away. And the other thing I want to bring up is the fact that in, in your presentation last week, you, t you partially blamed the elimination of the deputy chief position in that Chief Mulliken wanted to 
compensate the battalion chiefs because they had ad added responsibility since they eliminated the deputy chief position. And if, correct me if I'm wrong, but you said maybe we need to look at bringing the deputy chief position back. Do you know where the recommendation came for to eliminate the deputy chief position? It came in June of 2007, a month and a half or so after the executive leave memo, which was May 1st. And it was recommendation that Jason Gage, your predecessor, had hired a study be done of the operation and management and organization of the Salina Fire Department. Mr. Belichick, you were, I'm you were the city manager at that time, and Mr. Peck, I think if you go back and look, I looked at the minutes, you were on the city commission at that time. What I'm saying here is that there is a whole lot that hasn't been dealt with here. $100,000 audit report, probably approaching $100,000 from attorney fees, $75,000 in vacation time allotted, and I just have one quick question if you were indulge me. Actually, because we didn't start the timer, so please wrap it up. Okay. What is, what is the penalty for lying to a forensic auditor? What is the penalty of lying to an investigator if we actually had a real investigation of this matter? And I would ask this, too, because you have employed this technique in the past when it really wasn't as important. Was there ever any consideration about having Chief Mulliken or anybody else involved in this procedure, including the former city manager, HR director, anyone else that might have been, any consideration whatsoever to have them fill out and sign sworn affidavits? All right. We've done it in the past. I just think that, you know what? Thank you. This th you guys, you guys, I hope you won't pass this thing and just br but brush it under the rug. I can't believe that you're not more outraged than you are. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to this matter? And not seeing anyone um, online. I'll bring it back to the commission for further discussion. The, the only thing I would like to say is... Um, I think Mr. Blanchard uh, made it seem a little bit more black than white than it really was. I um, can tell you from discussions we've had, there was a lot more went into this than, than his comments. Um, everyone's welcome to step up and have their comments. Um, I disagree with quite a bit of what Mr. Blanchard said, but I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, <clears throat> I think the only thing that I would like to say is I looked back on, we had a um, executive session around the 1st of March, March 2nd, actually, of 2020. And following that executive session, I did um, reach out <coughs> to staff and um, uh, did say that I don't think this administrative leave policy adopted by this line of fire department should be ignored, but we should take the opportunity to see how our personal leave is structured and how it, can be, how it can work better and be counted more accurately for Salina Fire Department staff. After thinking about this all night and depending on the cost, I'm not sure how much getting a forensic financial investigator advances the conversation. Um, I'll leave out the specifics. Um, various disciplinary suggestions. Um, and an announced zero tolerance for future leave manipulations and a review of how our leave time is structured and recorded. Um, anyway, spending $50,000 on an in-depth investigation doesn't seem like a good investment unless we are per considering pursuing criminal action against current and former Salina Fire Department staff. And the, the only thing, I mean, one thing I, d I definitely agree with, with, with Mr. Blanchard on is I wish we would have just taken the most direct route at the very beginning because I think that we could have saved a lot of community discord, a lot of taxpayer uh, funds, and um, I, you know I think at this point there's not going to be a resolution that that satisfies um, the fire department, that satisfies the citizens, that satisfies the governing body. So, at any rate, um, I'll turn it over to anyone else who has anything to say. Uh, Mayor, yeah, you know, 
this has been you know, one of those situations in which it's real easy to look in retrospect, knowing what we know at the end and look at all the mistakes we may have made along the way. Certainly we need to look at how often we review policies in every department, no matter how trivial the policy seems to be and have rules on what types of policies can be enacted without higher uh, approval. Uh, a lot of people in town have, have, have glamorized this you know, into a, 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 uh, you know, a, a theft of, of public resources, uh, but that's a hard thing to prove. What we've tried to do over time is to see if indeed that is the case. Uh, just you know, the difficulty that we had in identifying you know, how the leave was being used uh, uh, you know, points to how probably why we didn't know about it sooner. Uh, but the more we've found out and, and some of, you know, personal details, obviously we, we, we're not going to divulge, uh, but this has not been as black or white an issue as it would seem on the, on the, on the surface. Uh, we've certainly, I think, have an opportunity to put in many, many safeguards to keep something like this from happening again. Uh, but there's 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 enough you know, responsibility uh, and culpability to to share in all all aspects. Uh, but it certainly you know, I think lets us know how we have to re review our, our our policies. This is probably not going to be one of those things where there's going to be a front page, you know, settlement. You know, we got them. You know, crook snapped. Um, and you know, even you know, making decisions like that involves more than what we can discuss in open open session. Um, it, the, the bad thing in issues like this is that uh, some of the information that's used to make decisions can't be divulged, which is you know a, a shortcoming of any governmental or municipal process. Uh, and I don't know a good way around it. Uh, and it's just where at some point people have to have faith that we're making the best decision possible. Uh, it's not going to satisfy everybody. We could have done a whole lot of things quicker. Uh, and, and some of Mr. Blanchard's suggestions uh, are, are, are taken as examples. Uh, but with these decisions were being made in real time further back with limited information compared to what we have now. And it's, it, this is just not going to be one of those clean things at the end. I mean, there's going to be dirt left on the sidewalk. And it's, it's you know, we have to at some point consider what's best for the organization as far as moving forward. I'll Thank pass. You. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak to this? All right, then we'll consider action here. Mayor, I move we approve resolution number 218003. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve resolution number 21-8003. All in favor say aye. 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 And count uh, Vice Mayor Davis is an aye. All those, yes. all those opposed, nay. And that motion passes 4-1. We don't have any development business today, but we do have um, three executive sessions under other business. Before we proceed with those, are there any items under other business that a commissioner would like to uh, bring up? <coughs> Hearing none, then we'll go on to item 9.1. Uh, uh, Mayor, I move that the city commission recess into executive session for... And do we uh, let's try 25 minutes. 25 minutes. To discuss the subject of potential acquisition of specific real estate, the identification of which would be contrary to the public interest based upon the need for preliminary discussion of, of the acquisition of real property pursuant to KSA, KSA 754319B6. The open meeting will resume in this meeting at... If I could, if I could suggest we have a little bit bigger gap to deal with technology transition um, before we start the executive session. Five minute break. Uh, even maybe a right, ten minute. Ten minute break. Preceded so we'll by a ten minute. 
break, so we would be back at. It'll be preceded by a 10 minute break and uh, then into executive session at 5.55. Well, we'll return at 5.55. We'll go in at 5.30. 5.30 and then resume, the open meeting will resume in this room at 5.55. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And that motion passes 5 0, and we will be back in session at 5 55 p.m. We are back in open session and we have Vice Mayor Davis with us virtually, and we need to extend our executive session for another 10 minutes. So, Mayor, I will move the City Commission recess into executive session for 10 minutes to discuss the subject of potential acquisition of specific real estate, the identification of which would be contrary to the public interest based upon the need for preliminary discussion of the acquisition of real property <laughs> pursuant to KSA 754319B6. The open meeting will resume in this meeting at 607. 607. 607. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes 5-0. All right, welcome back to the um, City Commission meeting. Um, the request for executive session, um, real estate did indicate possible action to follow and if I'm understanding the consensus of the governing body, we're um, ready to proceed with some action. I have a motion, Mayor. I move that the city be authorized to A, participate as a bidder on behalf of the city at an auction of the real estate described as a 1.6 acre tract located at 0000 East Ash next to the warehouse at 225 North 3rd Street on Tuesday, December 14th and B, in order to serve the public interest by enabling the city to potentially purchase the real estate at the least cost to the public to bid on the real estate <clears throat> up to the maximum bid identified by the governing body during the executive session. Second. Mayor, if I, oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Yes, Mayor, please, if I may. Yes, please, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to suggest that um, going into the discussion, there was no awareness of your interest in the matter had not been presented to you at all. Mm. Uh, I wonder, with uh, the benefit of the discussion during the executive session, if it would be helpful to have uh, Mr. Scragg or city staff describe uh, the interest in the potential uh, utilization of that property uh, as you consider whether to authorize staff to, to participate in the auction. Uh, would would staff like to, to sure, speak I can to that? Try to do that briefly. Um, essentially, the lot in question is a vacant lot <clears throat> located in close proximity to our general services facility located on Ash Street. Um, and as you may know, um, real estate auctions seem to be occurring more frequently these days than listing them more traditionally. Um, so there's an opportunity to participate in that auction uh, for the purpose of uh, possibly acquiring that property um, for parking of our staff at general services and uh, possibly support of that general services location. Thank you. Any further questions or comments from members of the commission? Any questions or comments from members of the public? Just real quick, I hadn't anticipated this, but John Blanchard Salina. Um, is that the Bennett, is that the property that is the Bennett building is on? And does that include the land that was once considered using funds for, from the star bonds to, to use as field house um, overflow parking and, and is that a potential use and is that a pot potential funding source? So two, two separate parcels, the building sits on a separate parcel than the vacant lot. It was um, 
contemplated in the development agreement, but the intention would not be, it, given the development of the field house and parking and what we've kind of learned in the interim, uh, the intention would not be to use the star bond funds for the purchase. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have any questions or comments? I'll bring it back to the commission for action. I don't know that I can restate that motion. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> except, yes. if, I mean, should I? I if you, yeah, if you, if you wouldn't mind, that'd I be move great. That Thank the city you. be authorized to a to participate as a bidder on behalf of the city at the auction of the real estate described as a 1.6 acre tract located at 0000, that's five zero Z stash, next to the warehouse at 225 North Third Street on Tuesday, December 14th. 2021 and be in order to serve the public interest by enabling the city to potentially purchase the real estate at the least cost to the public to bid on the real estate up to the maximum bid identified by the governing body during today's executive session. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Second. Aye. aye. I th well, I think oh, we already had. Oh, did we second? Okay. Yeah, we had okay. to. Okay. All right. And that, that, that <clears> motion <throat> passes 5-0. All right, so now we move on to our next executive session, um, a request for legal. And how yeah, long do you anticipate yeah. we will need on this? 25 minutes didn't work very well the last time, but let's try it again. 25? Okay. Please. Okay. Uh, I move that the city commission recess into executive session for 25 minutes <coughs> to discuss the subject of an open records request received from Alex Flippen on behalf of KWCH 12 Eyewitness News for documents related to the fire, line of fire department admin leave time matter that legal counsel based upon the need for consultation with an attorney for the public body, which would be deemed privileged in the attorney client relationship pursuant to KSA 754319B2. The opening meeting will resume in this meeting at 638. Um, that'll be 640. 640. Say 25 minutes. Yep. 640. Second. We have a motion and a second to recess into executive session for 25 minutes, uh, resuming the open session in this room at 640. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And we'll resume. I just want to disclose that Terrell Mock, uh, legal counsel with Fisher Patterson, will be joining us by phone. Thank you. All right, thank you. We're back in um, public session. Um, we do not have any action to take on this item. And we do have one final request for an executive session on personnel. Um, it's uh, time for the city manager's annual performance review. And um, we're working through that process. Um, I would suggest we need about 20 minutes, if that sounds what and I would request that <laughs> Commissioner Peck not laugh at the suggestion of 20 no, minutes. I <laughs> okay. <laughs> Getting punchy here. All right. 20 minutes. We'll try. Mayor, I move the city commission recess into executive session for 20 minutes. Discuss the subject of the city manager's annual performance evaluation based upon the need to discuss personnel matters of non elected personnel pursuant to KSA 7540. 319B1. The open meeting will resume in this room at 701. 701. Second. Seven we have a motion and a second to recess into executive session, resuming in the open meeting at, I'm sorry, 702. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. All right, we are resuming the open meeting. We are going to need another um, 15 minutes, and we don't anticipate any action sure. to follow. We're still in the pretty early phases of this, so if you're tired of tune, tuning in, you're not. I don't think you're going to miss anything. So, another 15 minutes, if we could have. Mayor, I move the city commission recess into executive session for 15 minutes to discuss the subject of potential acquisition of specific no, real estate. No, no, no. Next one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got the old agenda. <laughs> I was reading the last one, but it's uh, 
<laughs> well, see, I wasn't even listening. I was right. I was right there with Commissioner Ryan. I, was, I left we were going to be talking about real estate. Your, okay. Yeah, Here's the, here. Aaron Correct. has it if you need it. I love you. Mine, it. Yeah. Go ahead. You can Sorry about it. that. Aaron, I think Aaron. I move the city yeah. commission recess into executive session for 15 minutes to discuss mm -hmm. the subject of the city manager's annual performance evaluation based upon the need to discuss personnel matters of non-elected personnel pursuant to KSA 75. 4319B1. The opening meeting will resume in this room at 717. Second. We have a motion and a second to recess into executive session, resuming at 717 in this room. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. All right, welcome back. Um, I see that we've got Vice Mayor Davis back on screen and mm -hmm. um, as predicted, we have no action to take and so I would accept a motion to adjourn. So Mayor, I move we adjourn. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.